It's clear from the Bible that fallen men are born liars. Romans 3, 4 says, Let God be true and every man a liar. Every fallen man is at heart a liar. And because of this, he is a child of the devil who is the father of lies, according to John 8, 44. Children lie to their parents. Parents lie to their children. Husbands lie to their wives. Wives lie to their husbands. People lie to their employers who in turn lie to them and often in the public. Politicians lie to get elected and continue to lie once they are elected. People lie to the government, perhaps most notably on their income taxes. Our society is built on a framework of lies. Now, the Bible has much to say about lying. First, it reveals God's hatred of it. Proverbs 6, 16-19, listed as one of the six things the Lord hates and calls it an abomination. Proverbs 12, 22 also says, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are His delight. The Bible also forbids lying. In Exodus 20 and verse 16, which is the ninth commandment, it says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And then we hear in Leviticus 19.11, it also says, you shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. Even in Colossians 3.9, Paul exhorted the believers at Colossae when he said this, do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. But you know, lying is also a characteristic of unbelievers. It's not a characteristic of believers. That's not to say that believers will never struggle with this, because they struggle with all sin. But it is not a habit of their life. We hear in Psalm 58, verse 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb, and they go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. But on the other hand, Proverbs 13.5 says, A righteous man hates lying. And so since God hates lying, and the Bible forbids lying, and since it's a characteristic of unbelievers and not believers, James addresses here in chapter 5 and verse 12 the issue of speaking truthfully with one another. Here in James 5.12, we will learn what it means to be a person of your word. If you say something, your word should be enough. Because your life is characterized as being truthful. Now, if you look there at chapter 5 and verse 12, this section begins by telling us, above all. Above all is a preeminent and a pervasive command. It's not totally divorced from the preceding context, but it's the first of several commands that close out this letter. He says here, but above all. And this could be better translated, now above all, or and above all. Because James is here introducing a new subject. But let me say this. It's very important to note that just because this verse occupies just one place here in James chapter 5, some may be tempted to dismiss it altogether. As saying it's something that's not really that important because James doesn't devote a whole lot of time to it. But let me say this. What is found here in chapter 5 and verse 12 is deeply profound. What he has to say to us is deeply convicting. This is hitting on an area as well as the rest of this book that addresses issues in our life. And I just certainly want to encourage you to come to this text prayerfully. Vernon D. Orson says here that the above all, it has reference to the sins related to speech, which was a continuing problem that James has addressed. And listen, it should not be any surprise that James closes this letter by talking about speech, because he did so in every chapter of this epistle. So again, it shouldn't be any surprise. Now notice something else that we find here in verse 12. James addresses his audience with that familiar term, brethren. He uses that term 15 times in this epistle. And here he personalizes it. He says, my brethren. And the term here is showing that his attitude was not one of condescension, but it was one of compassion. He is identifying with them. 
He's identifying with them as one who also needed to guard his own mouth and speak the truth. See, to him, speaking the truth was an essential, important matter. Now, if you notice the remainder of the verse, he says there, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. Here in this one verse, James gives us the prohibition, the instruction, and the motivation. Notice, first of all, the prohibition. He says here, do not swear. Now, the prohibition that James here is employing is not referring to profanity. That certainly is picked up over in Ephesians chapter 4, and I believe it's verse 29 when it says, do not let corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But no, this is referring to invoking God's name or substituting God's name as a guarantee that the truth of what we say. See, James does not have in mind here the rare, solemn, and the proper use of oath, but rather the needless, flippant, and vain use of swearing. Now we have, as children growing up, and maybe even as adults, use that phrase, I swear to God. And we use that as an affirmation of the truth of what we are saying. And here James is going to address that whole issue. But before we go any further, let me give you a definition of an oath. An oath is for solemn situations. It's a way of proving the truthfulness of something that's about to be said. And here's the definition. An oath is a solemn appeal to God to verify the truth of a statement or the binding character of a promise. Let me say that again. An oath is a solemn appeal to God to verify the truth of a statement or the binding character of a promise. Again, it's for solemn situations. It's for a way of proving the truthfulness of something that was said. The point of an oath was designed to foster credibility and integrity. And again, we do this today. We take oaths in court. The familiar phrase. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? That's an oath. We take oaths when we're sitting down with a loan agent, and seeking to buy a house or buying a car, you are legally binding yourself by that contract. That is an oath. You're basically saying, I promise to repay this loan. I took an oath on May the 7th, 1988, as I stood before a minister. I stood there with my bride. And I promised before God to love and cherish her to honor and to sustain her in sickness as in health, in poverty as in good that may light my ways, and to be true to her until death alone shall separate us. That right there was an oath. And let me say this, oaths, as we'll look at it today, people are making them flippantly, they're making it with no desire to fulfill it, and one area that we see it most in is in the issue of marriage. They stand before the altar, they take these oaths before God, before the assembled witnesses, and a few months passes and they're over there getting a divorce. They're not being true to their word. See, it used to be a day when your word was all that mattered. Your word was, well, as one movie that I saw a long time ago, it was your bond. And here the father, he is telling his son... And he's told his son over and over and over, he says, I'm going to spend time with you. You have my word. And finally his his son replied, because he said, my word is my bond. He said, yes, it's a junk bond. Because you never keep your word. Now that's why I said this hits in every area of our life. Because we want to be people of our word. And of course, the word of God. Amen? Amen. 